Welcome to The Lex Factor, a lawfully good podcast where we'll brief you on the business of law so you can build a better practice and capture more billable hours. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of The Lex Factor. It's your host, Lauren, here. And your co-host, Brad Pobble. Welcome, Brad. Where's my clap? Oh, yeah. Usually I get a clap. Okay. Yay! There it is. Yeah, there it is. Now, what we do. It doesn't feel as genuine. No, it doesn't. I'm sorry. I ask. <laughs> sorry, Brad. <laughs> Um, we actually have, we're back here today with Deb Nupp of Growth Play. Welcome back, Deb. Thank you. It's Welcome great to be back. back with you all. Yeah, It's so good day. to have you. We had so much fun last time. We did. Um, last time she was here, we talked a lot about business development. So we really wanted to dive even deeper um, in the business development world today and talk a lot more about making that actual pitch, quote unquote, and kind of closing the deal. Mm-hmm. So um, Deb, let's jump right in. How can attorneys really best move from relationship building to the actual pitching without being too pushy and too inappropriate? I think that's that that awkward area, that fine line where you're like, I'm here to get the sale and get a new client, but I I don't want to be obvious about it. Well, too, and the relationship is going so well because, Deb, you taught us how to build the relationship. (laughs) Right. So I may be jumping into that pitch. Exactly. And you don't want to seem like that relationship that you just built was not genuine. That's right. You know, like, hey, great, I love you. We went to lunch, but now uh, you owe me a little bit of money. (laughs) <laughs> that lunch was well, not free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it's it's a terrific question. And it's one that I see where a lot of the business development opportunities get really tripped up. Because if you think about our, our messages about how do you sell something on one end of the spectrum, people think, well, once I identify a target buyer, a target prospect, so this person is definitely a person who hires lawyers, they immediately want to jump to the pitch conversation in hopes that if they come in and do a big presentation, they're going to get hired. And when we go from having a target contact and we jump right to a pitch, it's like rushing rejection. Because wow. the reality is if there's no foundation of authentic relationship and there's no identifiable need, you're literally getting a courtesy presentation and then you get the proverbial um, outcome that sounds something like, we'll keep you in mind. Now, I just want to say for our audience's benefit, when people tell you they'll keep you in mind, I want you to know that they're probably not going to keep you in mind. They're <laughs> likely just being courteous and polite. So that when also we goes with dating. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, I mean, it's, it's not some you. Of this it's could, me. It's, it's not you. It's me. Yeah, yeah. I'll text you. <laughs> yeah, I'll text you later. So, so that <laughs> rushing of rejection says if you pitch too quickly, then you've really missed your opportunity because once someone says uh, thanks, we'll keep your information on file. We'll keep mm. you in mind. The reality is it's not like you can go back and say, well, can we do this again next week? You actually elongate your sales process if you pitch too quickly. But as difficult and as unsavory as rushing the rejection, I'll tell you a more insidious outcome of pursuit of business. And that's getting stuck in the friend zone Mm. where you're investing and engaging and investing and engaging and you're giving, you're giving, and and it's not advancing to something more permanent. And while I know many of the analogies sometimes in sales do sound a little bit like courtship, (laughs) um, I will tell you that getting stuck in the friend zone really is the product of a couple of things. Number one, the person that you're engaging has absolutely no intention to ever do business with you, and they simply like the free whatever you're giving them. (laughs) And if that is the case, you would be far more likely to have a better outcome if you just simply knew the likelihood, the receptivity, the interest Mm -hmm. of exploring business opportunities at some point in the future. So one of the ways to avoid friend zones altogether is to make your declaration of saying, hey, I'm really excited to be spending time with you. And is there ever an opportunity or could you envision an opportunity where we could ever explore Mm -hmm. doing work together? Sometimes having that clarity early on can certainly tell you whether or not to keep investing. I think another area, again, where we need to make our declarations known, this often happens with our personal connections. Someone you know that you work with personally, you don't want to come off sales or you're manipulative. And what you need to be able to say is, you know, I really like you, Brad, and our friendship means a lot to me. (laughs) And I would be remiss to say, if you ever needed anything professionally, I would be interested in being a resource to you. I'd be interested in, in helping you solve for that. Sometimes in our personal relationships, our friends don't actually know that we would be interested in doing business. And research Mm -hmm. will tell us Mm -hmm. that if you're not bringing it up with those personal connections, sometimes they make the assumption that you're not interested because you're not bringing it up. They may think, oh, it would be such a burden to ask Deb to help my company or help me with this. So 
I'm going to make the assumption that she's not interested. So a big part of making the transition is not to rush rejection. And it's also not to get cut in the friend zone. Oh my gosh. It's like this balance. You have to get it just right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, and then when you think about it, uh, ultimately, when a person has a business need, when when they transition from interpersonal connectivity to, mm, I'm in the market for hiring a lawyer, usually there's something that's occurred that is fairly clear or identifiable. Now, in the first episode, I talked a lot about three things. Well, in this episode, I'm going to talk about four things. Taking it up so a notch. Take, anyway, here we go. Taking it up a notch. So when you are moving from relationship into a a time of transition right before you go into the sales pitch in the transition space. One of four things has occurred. The client or prospective client or friend has a known legal concern or a known business concern for which a lawyer would be needed. Mm -hmm. And when a concern is made visible, the pitch often kind of takes care of itself. The second though, if they don't have a known concern, a transition will occur because they have curiosity because you've introduced something that makes them go, huh, maybe I should check that out. Or maybe we should be investigating that too. Third is this area of confidence. I can tell you that buyers of legal service definitely appreciate having a little CYA. That no matter how <laughs> confident they are in their strategy, their approach, or their counsel, mm-hmm. being willing to be a second set of eyes or bringing uh-huh. an extra level of confidence building will often get them into the mode of sales interest. And finally is connection. People like to do business with winners. And sometimes when it comes to moving from a personal relationship or a friendship into a transition point, it's because you've said something or you've made such a strong recommendation that this client must meet your great friend, Lauren, who's a subject matter expert in a particular arena. You will then find based on the strength of connection, the person says, okay, I'm receptive. I'd I'd love to meet her. I'd love to meet him Mm -hmm. to find out if there's something we could do together. So managing this zone of transition is an essential so that you don't come off as being too pushy or inappropriate. Wow, that is great yeah. advice. It is. And she, she called me a winner as opposed to you. So. I know. <laughs> I, I, actually, I get that quite a bit, but it's, oh. it's, it's, it's okay. It is, oh. it, I, you know, it's still we, we difficult. Have this, we like to tease each other, so it's not, it's, it's not I'm, abnormal. I'm trying to talk to the sorry, guest sorry, here. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> you know, during this phase, it is, it is. you know, I, I agree all of those things are triggers that allows you to take that next transition. What And I'm, I may be throwing you a curve here, but what if one of those four things don't happen, but you're still wanting to make that transition, that pitch? Should you just hold off or should you go for it? Well, I I think it would be best. It's probably, it's not just hold off and it's not go for it. I think it is in the inviting the person to give you feedback or advice. And so one of the coaching things that we describe is called the dream out loud conversation. Brad, be prepared to be blown away. Okay. (laughs) This is a can't miss conversation because it results in something either neutral to very positive when you're interested in moving from a friendship or from a dormant client into paid work. And the Dream Out Loud basically starts with authentic acknowledgement. Brad, I value our friendship. I value um, your historical, you know, I value your loyalty, whatever I value. I say something that is authentically acknowledging to you. Number two, I communicate to you my goal, a dream, a vision. So I would say, Brad, I really value your opinion. I value our friendship. Here's my goal. My dream is to have more opportunities to serve your company in lots of other ways. I want to solve more problems. Or I have a dream of being more known with people like yourself who have Mm -hmm. your job title. Or I have a dream of being more visible in the industry like you're visible. When you tell a person what your goal or vision is, now they can get a mental picture so that when you make an ask, which is the third step, you're asking for feedback and advice or input. Brad, if you were me, what would you do? So if I'd like to widen my relationship with your company, if you were me, what would you do? And the worst thing you might say is, Deb, I'd give up on that dream. But chances are, (laughs) what you might really say is you might actually give me guidance on what I would need to do next, or you would give me a temperance of other alternatives. But at minimum, I've acknowledged you Mm -hmm. and I've shared with you a vision that may be something of value later when one of those C's has triggered. Wow. Wow. Well, let's switch it up, uh, taking the virtual world that we live in now. How is it different? Uh, I know probably the same rules apply, but do you do anything different in a virtual type environment for these type of things? 
Yeah. So once you get invited to a pitch, I think you have to look at it with what needs to be happening at the beginning or, or, or before you get into the room. Um, about 80% of whether or not your relationship or your sales opportunity is going to advance is actually going to occur in the preparation. Most people think the magic happens in the dialogue or the choreography of the moment. Mm -hmm. But the reality is where you have the most to control and the most variables is before you get into that room. So you've got to be thinking about strategy. You've got to be thinking about outcomes. You've got to be thinking about what are the right questions to ask? What are the right messages? And you've got to be planning for any number of scenarios for what might happen as a next step, best case, likely case, and worst case. So having a real handle on the preparation before you get in the room is going to be one of the essential best practices. In a virtual world, you're going to need to also add in some of the other logistical things like time zone, technology, materials, what, how you want to navigate speaking parts and the mm -hmm. choreography, because you don't have the same opportunities to read body language or, or visual cues in the way you would if you could be in person. But pre-advanced planning and preparation, it is the place that acts like a sign of honor. And so we often, when we're coaching, we say, look, if you'll do a core four for preparation, and there's the four, be really clear about what outcome or objectives we're trying to get for this meeting. Number two, what are those key messages what do we need to be saying? What's new? What are the stories that are going to be most relevant and in service to this client, whether they do business with us or not? Thirdly, what are the discovery questions we need to ask so we can signal what we care about? Because what we ask about is a signal what we care about. And then number four, we need to anticipate what might happen next so that we can set a definitive next step. And a definitive next step is time boxed and it's set in the moment. So even if you say to me, we'll keep you in mind, my definitive next step pre planned would be to make an offer of an in to an invitation to something or an insight sharing, some way to stay connected to you, even in the space of not doing business together. So in a virtual cell, that pre-event, pre-planning is key. I think when you're in the event, it's all about choreography. In some cases, it's like theater. Just make sure people know what parts they're speaking to, how they're going to respond, who's on cue to handle what objection, to ask which question. Because again, a well-choreographed, um, experience in the room virtually is a bit of an audition of what it will feel like to work with you as a client. And that's really what that moment is. A sales pitch is an audition. Right. If you think about it in that manager's yeah, point. It really is. Then of course there's the follow-up. And in a virtual world, I think again, speed is king. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to have the occasion to, you know, casually run into one another or to see one another. So you want to be really clear and time boxed on your next steps and in fact, really follow through usually with something written or in writing. So we recommend, again, a summary of next steps so that it gives the, the prospect or the client the experience that you're already working together because you're producing some valued work product that they may very well be able to use or share with others. Yeah. I really like that you brought up objections. And so that kind of leads into a question I was thinking about while you were talking. Um, you know, say, for example, you get shot down, you know, the business isn't going to happen right now. But like you said, hey, you know, even though we're not going to do business together, I'm hosting this webinar next week. Why don't you tune in or whatnot? So what other ways can you handle those objections? Because they're going to happen, whether it's virtually or in real life, we all get shot down from time to time. But how do you how do you come on top of that? Well, it starts with the right mindset to expect that, you know, this is a long game and mm -hmm. not winning doesn't mean not ever. I think, again, when you look at objections, most human beings tend to respond either with a defensiveness um, or they'll be a bit diffusing or they will um, certainly try to discount or, or try to price their way into the, into the marketplace. And so we often say when somebody gives you an objection, like we're not ready to do business or we like who we're working with or your fees are too high. You want to have a readiness to respond to those objections like it's an extension of the dialogue. It's an extension of relationship building. So instead of getting shut down, you actually lean in, you step up, start with that acknowledgement, validate that you're listening. Say, you know, I, I can see why that you would be concerned about fees or, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's great. You like your current counsel or I can respect that timing is important to consider. Mm -hmm. Anytime your first reaction to an objection is something that affirms or acknowledges, it allows the person objecting a chance to you know, kind of warmly get connected to you. Then you want to ask some clarifying questions. So if they say your fees are too high, you can say, you know, I'm glad you brought this up. Fees are a really important part of the conversation. Here's the second piece. Let me ask you, when you say hi, what were you expecting? Mm -hmm. What's your budget? Mm -hmm. What are you accustomed to investing in this? So now you get a better understanding of what high means so that you can do the last piece, which is then advance an alternative solution, which could be 
a reconfigured scoping, or mm-hmm. it could be an agreement to make a discount if that makes makes sense yeah. for the long game. But but at least you're navigating the objection to advance the relationship or to stay in the relationship without getting it shut down. Yeah. And I like your real life examples, too. I think they're really relatable. They, they are. They are. I believe so, too. For everybody. For everybody. So I'm walking through it. I'm you know playing this out. We've sat down. We're having the conversation. I've built the relationship. We're at that point to where I'm. Uh, one of the four things have occurred where you know it's they're interested in it. I've made the pitch, but I I'm nervous about the ask. I'm nervous about getting down to that actual. Let's sign. Let's do you know to make that final step to official. Any advice there? What what are some things that the lawyers can do? Yes, so it sounds it's, personal. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it is. I have a How do friend I ask Deb. Her out? I have a friend Deb <laughs> that has been in the friend zone. No, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, so I think it begins really with that relationship mindset, much like you would if you think about uh, when you want to take a maybe a more casual dating relationship to a more serious <laughs> dating relationship, or or even more permanent For to take that friend, dating yes. relationship into marriage. So I often get asked this question, you know, I, if I could just make the ask, then then all my sales troubles will be behind me. And, and, and I often say, well, again, rushing rejection, making the ask too quickly is surely to get you shot down. So the first thing I would say to you is put yourself in the mindset of the person who's going to be on bended knee with ring in hand and ask yourself, what's the probability that when I get on bended knee and say, will you marry me? Or when I have the, you know, define the relationship, the DTR, and you say, we're going to be exclusive. What's the probability that the person on the other end is going to say yes? And if I ask a lot of people who were in the proposing mode, they kind of said it was a sure thing. And that's because you've done the work to really understand the other party's priorities and interests, and you get alignment before you ask the question so that you can essentially avoid the rejection. And so making the ask is really about preparing the soil for planting the seed. It's about the readiness of making the ask before you actually make the ask. So as I think about getting ready, it's about alignment. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to something that I shared with you all in my first episode, which is something we call the six qualifiers, six things that need to be true in order to make the ask. And so you don't want to ask unless, number one, you and the prospect are clear that there's a problem to be solved. And you both agree it's a problem we're solving. Mm -hmm. Number two is the solution. Do you and the prospect agree that what's being presented or proposed is the best fit solution? Third, urgency. Are you on the same page with timing? Are we clear that this is the right time to take a step forward? Fourth, access. Do you know the decision makers and are you clear about their decision making criteria and process? Number five, have you gotten alignment on expectations? Is there a reality set that you share between you and the prospect? And then lastly, have you gotten really clear on budget and dollars? Generally speaking, lawyers will make the ask in a time and space where they don't have all six things true client may have a problem and they may really, really like the solution. But if you say to the client, so are you ready to get, you know, to get Mm -hmm. on with this? Are we going to, you know, are we going to do business together? There are so many variables that are still yet unclear. Again, you may get rejected or you may get an elongation of your sales process. So making the ask is making sure that you and the other party are on the same page. So even if you have to ask, there's a higher probability that there will be you know, joy and balloons and tears <laughs> and enthusiasm <laughs> for moving ahead. That's great. Um, and Deb, you provided so many good tips all the way from, you know, preparing to do that pitch to closing the deal. During that whole process, how do you just wow this potential client? Like what cool things can you do just to just to get them on your side and build that relationship and help them be more likely to close that deal? Well, I think there's it's a process learn of building super fans. Mm-hmm. And if I could give you a visual, if you can imagine somebody who's a fan of any team or any music group, there's some usual identifiers, <laughs> right? You probably have some wearable with the name of the team. Uh-huh. You may have even bought a ticket back when you could go to the game. Um, there may be something identifying, you know, with you. Some of you own a foam finger that says number one fan. <laughs> I mean, there are things uh-huh. which are the telltale signs that this is some this is a team or a, or a, a band um, that you're in support of. 
that is important and it's a critical starting point. As you're thinking about the pursuit of business, you want to cultivate fans. You want to get people to feel good about your brand, about your offering, and about you. The challenge is, though, fandom isn't sufficient when it comes to actually making the sell and keeping the sell, keeping the client over the long term. Okay. So even though we may have a condition where a client or a prospect really likes us and they're a fan of us and our firm, mm -hmm. and they may even do an initial project and be satisfied, shifting the gears to wow them is to make them super fans. And so this is the difference between somebody who politely goes to a game and sits and watches and somebody who like paints their face <laughs> or tattoos the name of the team on their person, right? <laughs> you know, or the they name go, of their lawyer. you know, <laughs> and so, so when you begin to think about, well, what is it then you can do to create that kind of super fandom uh -huh. of that loyalty? The first condition isn't just that that super fan likes you. A super fan also likes who they are when they're doing business with you. You see, to be a super mm -hmm. fan, there's something about the entity, the team, the identity that I feel great about who I am because I'm doing business with you. And the way that that happens is it's made, it's cultivated. And so some wows could be the extra value adds, that extra level of concern, that extra measure of thoughtfulness, the predictability in communication and status. It's establishing, I will never surprise you with a bill. You know, I will always mm -hmm. make sure that you never get an invoice that you weren't anticipating. If it isn't in alignment with what you're expecting, I will always alert you in advance. Um, I will never delay bad information. I will always um, give you an upfront heads up so that you're not surprised. And so there are any number of things that you can engineer into something that's called the client experience. And by building that in with a sense of purpose and, and to engineer in the priority, you'll be amazed at how much loyalty and super fandom that can follow in large part because it's predictable, it's planful in the lawyer's execution. So there's a lot that can be done, but certainly you start to simulate that all throughout the sales process. And coming back to a point we made earlier, if you're more interested in giving wisdom, in giving insight, in giving perspective during the sales pursuit, that leaves the prospect or client stronger, more wise, more capable. If you do that as you were going in a selfless, suspended self-interest, you are beginning to plant the seeds for the first stroke of paint on the face. Mm. Wow. There we I go. like it. I know. I like how you ended that. I know. I do too. <laughs> well, Deb, I, I really enjoyed talking to you and I think our listeners do too. You just give such good real world advice, things that anybody can do and anybody can put into action. And I really value that. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate and that you probably much. remember from our first episode, we like to end with a couple things that our listeners can take away. So I'll go ahead and put you on the spot again. If you had to say, hey, I want to make sure everybody listening leaves with this one thing today, what would that be? Well, I think it's the, the recognition that when you are in the pursuit of a new business or new sales opportunity, Leveraging empathy and understanding about the readiness of the other party is probably the hardest thing to sustain, that patience. It's also, though, very important not to have so much patience that you get stuck in the friend zone <laughs> on, you know, on the road to going nowhere. So mm -hmm. I think there has to be a lot of courage and communication about your desire, declaring your intention, dreaming out loud, and to listen for or look for, is there a concern have I triggered curiosity? Is there an opportunity to give more confidence? Is there an attraction or connection that makes authentic sense to the other person? Mm -hmm. And I think if you can live there, a lot of the sales execution and closing will ultimately take care of itself. Is Brad, it my turn? Brad, I can feel I'm, it. I'm looking at you, You're, Brad. I can feel no your eyes. No one can see looking. it. They're burning. I know. I can. So really, my takeaway from it was I like the part about the discussion around the proposal. That was big for me because, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Deb, so certainly <laughs> chime in if you think this is off base, but I really took away the message that in many cases, you know the answer is going to be yes, you're going to do business with me before I even ask that question. So I have that level of confidence, just like the example you gave in the marriage proposal. So I wish I would have had that advice earlier, but oh. <laughs> no, no, I'm so happily you know, married. When you know, you know. <laughs> you just know, and when you know, you know, but that's really good advice. <laughs> Advice because you can feel that you can feel that connection and then you know that answer is going to be yes so well, it takes so away that if, fear absolutely and i'll just build on this and if you don't know well then that tells you you need to do more investigation more mm -hmm. discovery mm -hmm. more right. communication so that you build That's that true, level yeah. of clarity 
right? It's not the it's end not of the world. Over. If you die. No, yeah. Right. It just means not yet. Right. Yeah. Not okay. yet. I like that. Not yet. Maybe later. Not yet. Um, so I'm going to leave with two just because there was so much good stuff and I really like it You all. just had to show us up, didn't you? I know. Yeah. I, know. I was waiting to make sure no one <laughs> else gave two. Do you notice, Deb, so how she I waited could... to the last so she could take two? Deb mm-hmm. did say I was the winner earlier. I don't know. Yeah, she's she the winner, though. She's just, she's just being who she is, Brad. I know. It's just me. I'm just extra. All I'm right. Just kidding. Um, so one thing I, I really like that you mentioned, Deb, and it's easy, is let people know you're available to help. You know, like you said, there, there could be people that you know that are out of business right now out of business out of out of work right now mm-hmm. let's let's say that they could be out of business too though out of business by virtue of being out of business also out, out of work, work. They, they go together i was gonna say we could edit that out but you guys you guys <laughs> rolled with it and made it work okay. so thank you um but let people you know that you're available to help let people know in your network your friends potential clients whatever it's a, it's just a matter of saying hey if you ever need anything i'm here so they know that you truly are there you know otherwise they may be left wondering hey i could really use brad's help but i'm not sure if he's up for it. I don't want to ask, whatever. Um, So I really like that. And then two, keep in touch after that objection. So it maybe it's over now, but it may not be over permanently. So if someone says, no, you know, I don't currently want to move forward with this, whatever it is, follow up with them, you know, say, hey, that's great. I'd love to keep in touch. Do you want to grab a coffee? Um, I'm speaking at this event next week. Why don't you check it out? Whatever, something like that. So I really think that's important. Just keep in touch after the objection and keep that relationship going. Deb, thank you so much for being with us today. I've learned so much. It was great advice across the board. Definitely. Will you come back and uh, talk with us again one day? I would be honored. Please ask me back. It's been great being with you all. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Lex Factor, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to The Lex Factor. Lexicon takes care of business so you can take care of law. Learn how to build a better practice at lexiconservices.com.